and welcome to episode 99 of the XRM Toolcast. This is our special Wayne Gretzky episode, as we are on number 99. And in honor of such, we brought in a Canadian, an MPP, a blogger, a previous guest, and a reformed accountant, Matthew Devaney, to talk about Power Apps custom pages. And we do happen to start with that topic. We do happen to get off into lots of other topics this episode, which we are probably accustomed to if you listen to any episode, uh, even into chicken burgers, points versus pixels, horse AI, and then both Matt and Scott share their wish list for Canvas apps and custom pages. So uh, definitely a, a great episode. So sit back, relax, and let's get started. Hello and welcome to another episode of the XRM Toolcast. With me, your host, Daryl Always Raising the Bar. And Scott, I missed out on everything at Summit Drill. Scott, how's it going? Oh, thanks, Daryl, for that. Yeah, the FOMO was real. Yeah, it looked like you, you guys had a great time. You know, I was following everything on, on you know, Twitter and, and all of the social. So, I, you know, thank you to everyone who posted pictures to make me, you know, have even more FOMO. <laughs> That's, yeah, it was, it was great. Yeah. It was so funny walking around campus and I had a couple newbies first time there and I was walking through the exact same area of campus where I first met you in person and my first time in a summit and I'm like, oh, well, there's Scott DeRoe and he must know where we're going. So I like would go over and like talk to you and like, I have no idea where I'm going. Yeah, that, and, I remember and, that very well. Yeah, it was like, <laughs> like you can well, follow me at your there, guys. So I was like, because <laughs> I got there early and I was nervous and sketching everything and kind of like checking everything out. And so it was fun to see, to be on the other side of that fence and to see all these uh, these new devs, these new devs, the new MVPs. It's so difficult to kind of navigate around campus when you're not there all the time, and especially with all the different buildings. They all look mm -hmm. the same. And, and anybody who has ever gone anywhere navigating with me knows that I have a famously bad sense of direction. <laughs> like, literally, there is no way you could get a worse. I mean, I'm the kind of person that heads north instead of south when they're going onto a highway. That's the kind of. So, I mean, we went over to pick up my, uh, my eldest from uh, university because he's, you know, finished for the. He's studying biology and bring all these plants back and you know because he's got all these kind of mad experiments and stuff um and you know in the car there's all these plants you know, like cactus sticking into me and it's like and I, I had to go and pull over to to fix some stuff that was you know jangling around in the car and i just took a, I took a slip road off and then everyone in the car was like no and i didn't but anyway we had to kind of double back on ourselves for about i don't know an hour or something down the an highway because i couldn't get back onto it an hour oh <laughs> I, I'm noticing in this country that the highways are so long before you get an exit. And it's like, I'm not used to this. I'm used to a tiny little country where you have like <laughs> exits every mile or something like that. But anyway, we, we made it and, and all these, these plants and all these stuff are all kind of back finally. But, um, but yeah, his plants are somewhat worse for wear though, because uh, his housemate had a cat and uh it was nibbling at all his plants and eating them because that's what cats do apparently but um talking of cats uh so we our special guest today it has a special affinity with cats a special so, affinity with cats well let's yeah. go ahead and introduce our, our guest our guest today is matthew devaney a microsoft biz apps mvp consultant at hitachi solutions canva canada Oh, okay. Never mind. I'm, look, I'm just reading out the LinkedIn profile and it says Hitachi Solutions Canada. Then it says where you're from, Canada. It looks like that's part of your profile. So it's just kind of funny. It says Canada, Canada. But anyway, uh, welcome to the show again. Uh, you, you were not an MVP when we had you on. You were, <laughs> you were kind of like, I don't even know what I'm doing here, uh, sort of thing. Um, and, uh, and now you've become an MVP. You're, you know, we've got, yeah. uh, got the chance to meet at Summit uh, when we were there, and I realized that, oh, you're quite a bit taller than me. I was not expecting that. Um, <laughs> and uh, you're typically, you know, typically uh, kind and, and um, not kind. I'm, I'm, what's very long to think about? Canadian. Canadian. Not kind. Uh, I think that's the same or, kind. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, kind too. But, you know, you, you, you're the only person in Summit that I know of that, you know, stood up and, you know, got their question in thanked first thanked them first right for taking my question thank oh, you so yeah. much for taking my question no one else none of the mvps did that except for except for my canadian friend matt so anyway um yes matt, welcome, welcome matthew welcome hey thanks thanks for having me back on the show guys uh daryl it was really nice to see you at summit uh mm -hmm. i had a fun time on our little ice cream date yes. there i uh, never got a call back by the way so i'm still kind of waiting for that um, <laughs> <laughs> um please story about the first time i was on the pod here um i think it was with daryl and jonas mm -hmm. and it was the first podcast that I had ever done, and I had never touched a mall driven app. And as you know, the name of the podcast is called the XRM, XRM 
Toolcast. Toolcast. So we got into the point of the show, and I think you asked me, so so what do you think of XRM um, Toolkit? And I'm like, Toolbox. So I can't even get it right the second yes. time here, but I'm like, I don't even know what XRM Toolbox is. But now I know. I develop uh-huh. all, all driven apps at work, and uh, I love it. So okay. thanks okay. for having me back despite uh, my first visit. <laughs> no, that's great. Um, I know the first time um, at my first summit, uh, George Shabinsky interviewed me on the uh, – on the and the what is it serum podcast is that what it's called yeah serum yeah serum podcast yes. and you know i i you know listened to him for years and uh, at first i get over listening to him at normal speed because i was listening to him at double speed i was like he is talking so slow because i had two years of listening to him at, at double speed and uh and he asked me some question about something and you know and so it's kind of you know developer kind of you know idol of mine at the time and 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 I gave him an answer and he's like, Oh, that's dumb. It's like, he just like totally like, like shot me down and, and um, Sean Taylor was there. He just starts dying laughing. He's like, this is like this little innocent deer in the headlights. It just wham, gets completely <laughs> taken out. So yes, I understand the nervousness of, of being on a podcast for the first time and, and, and uh, being asked questions maybe that you don't know about or unsure about. So yes, um, that was a, a fun experience for me. For my first time, I'm glad we, we got to, to, to do that for you as well. It's all part of the fun. You're always faking it until you make it, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. You, you never know. You never know. <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah. You're you're definitely a uh, a Canvas app uh, expert. Although, yeah, I guess you had, had dived into a little bit of of, of model driven apps. And so, um, mm-hmm. you had a, a recent blog article on uh, how to make a Power Apps custom page. And so, it's kind of a, a fun marrying of your primary knowledge with, I guess, probably your maybe you could say your secondary knowledge of of, of model driven apps and, and marrying them together. And that's something that I've never actually had to do or ended up doing or something along those lines. So it's um, newer to me and then Scott, I'm sure has done it. You know, he's probably made 15 video games already using it that, that he doesn't even show them to the public because it's probably not good enough because he's, you know, half Canadian now anyway, because it was <laughs> whatever all else. <laughs> so I'll be the newbie here and ask the dumb questions. But uh, anyway, so um, why don't we explain to our listeners what a Power Apps custom page is at the, the very basic level here? So like you said, Daryl, uh, I'm coming from this at the perspective of a Canvas apps guru, right? Mm-hmm. I'm used to being able to do whatever I want, placing things wherever on the screen, having absolute control over them. So imagine me for the first time getting into a model-driven app and then just finding out, oh, by the way, you've created your table and this is where the things are going to go on the screen and you can't manipulate them, right? Uh, sorry, I'm going back to Canvas apps, but wait a minute. Now I've got these things called Power Apps custom pages and what mm-hmm. they allow you to do is bring Canvas app screens into model-driven apps, right? So now you're not really boxed in by the, the model-driven philosophy. What you can do is you can you can place things on the screen where you want, you can bring in code components. One thing I really like is that in a model-driven app, when you're building a form, you can usually only show data from one table on it. I, I know there's ways to bring other data in, but in a custom page, if I wanna make a dashboard style solution, I can bring in data from three different tables or four different tables and connect to all sorts of things. Um, absolutely love it. Awesome. So when I think of a form uh, in the model driven apps, uh, you know, it's for a particular entity and for a particular table. I'm sorry, I'll use the data versus terminology that Microsoft has been telling us to use for a while. Particular table. Uh, so when we're dealing with a Canvas apps, uh, we bring in that, that uh, Canvas app, uh, does that, do you need to select a particular like base table that is kind of the the base table that's being used in the in the app, or is it just completely random? You can select any sort of um, any app you want. It doesn't have to be anything directly related even to a table in, in uh, Dataverse. And uh, yeah, I'll, we'll start with there. <laughs> yeah, you could you could select any table that you like, and you don't have to select it up front. It's not like a mall driven app in that you're starting with the table and then you build the form. When you're starting with a custom page, you start with that blank canvas again. And just like when you're building a canvas app outside of the custom page experience, you can bring in any data that you like from anywhere. So uh, Dataverse, a very popular choice when you're building it inside of a model driven app. But hey, maybe you want to mix that with some data from SharePoint. Ooh, SharePoint, I know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not judging. It's fine. It's fine. No judging thing. I'll judge. I hate SharePoint, but that's okay. <laughs> I'll be American and say, no! Yeah. Everything I hate about Teams, I'm sure, is, is directly attached to SharePoint. 
<laughs> but that's the great thing. Like you can really bring in, in data and, and elements from, from anywhere. And you actually choose where are you going to display this after. Um, after you've built the Canvas custom page, you can choose, am I going to display it as just another uh, page for my left navigation? I click on the left navigation and it pops open in the main form. Or I could decide that, hey, I want to display this custom page as a modal, right? A square little box in the middle of the screen. Someone presses yes or no to close the box. Or you can also manifest that custom page as a right pane or a side pane. I don't know the technical name for that, but it's the same idea as a quick add or a quick view uh, menu. See, I told you I'm building mod rib maps these days. All these... All these, yeah, you're, you're growing. You're, 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 you're walking. You're all by yourself. You're all I grew up so fast. Grew up so yeah. fast. <laughs> Three years, yeah. The days were so short and the years are so long. Or the, yeah, Model the days driven so long. cuddler. <laughs> <laughs> Model driven cuddler. So just... <laughs> but, I mean, I totally, I totally agree in, the, in that, you know, the, the restrictions that you get from model driven apps, if you're using them, uh, is probably the biggest thing that people get concerned about when they select model driven apps it's like okay like you say i can only put things in a certain place they're fixed um and but obviously ironically sometimes those are actually the benefit because it's like consistency the speed of creating your apps and you don't have to worry about maintaining them um you know how how do you how do you position if now that you've got the ability to create a custom page alongside you know a model driven form or a model driven view where where would you position the custom pages and like would would you recommend people just saying hey you know i can just now every time i want to do any custom stuff i can just create a custom page and you know go crazy and just make in fact make everything custom pages you know how do you make that decision whether or not to stick with a model driven or use a custom page whenever i'm hitting up against a point where it's going to involve me actually breaking up the keyboard and writing some code as you know model driven apps are very configuration based that's why i love handing them off to clients putting them in clients hands if they want to add a new field or a new form or a new view they can just configure it instead of code it um but i start to make that decision on custom page or not i want to have to go ahead and like i said break out break out the keyboard there i am not um a pro coder right i know i know low code um i cut my teeth on excel I was an accountant before. <laughs> so if you ask me to do something like, hey, can we build a data validation into this field here and make sure that it's going to uh, submit properly and say it properly, like when I submit the form, I would start to think, okay, can I actually do that in JavaScript or am I gonna break out a, a Canvas app or a custom page to, to do that? Like Scott, if that were you, would you uh, be opening up the little JavaScript panel there and, and writing something in or? I every time. Every time. Type, it would be Every time. Type. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, great, the great thing is, if you're coming in from the Canvas app world and you don't have anybody to skill you up on the pro code side of things yet, right? it opens up an avenue for you to get what you want. So that's that's the first um, thing I would start to think about there, right? It just opens up new worlds for us as Canvas creators. But from from another perspective, like when, when should you actually go and use it? Um, let's bring up another example here. Sometimes when I'm creating a new record in a model-driven app, I want to have that wizard-like experience. Wizard-like experience takes you from one section of a form, data validates it, then it brings you to another, like hiding the previous thing that you just went to, and you kind of step through a form uh, in, in stages. That's something that I feel that Canvas apps can do really, really well, and custom pages can do really, really well. Whereas if you're doing a model-driven app, you'll likely have all the fields visible on the form at the same time, unless you set up business rules. And then it just kind of looks like things are popping into existence, like little lights going on inside the map. And that's an idea of when a Canvas custom page might help you uh, for the initial record creation, as, a, as opposed to the model driven app saying, here you are, I hope that you know which data fill in and, and when, right? So it's all about creating that custom logic and that custom, custom experience for the user. I love that. Yeah, I love that way of thinking about it, you know, like a, a guided user interface rather than just data entry. And yeah, yeah, I love that. Scott, any thoughts on how to uh, make a custom page look consistent with the rest of the, the forms and views in your model driven app? Because many times, as much as you have your custom pages, you also have that uh, model driven experience there too, for some tables. Any thoughts on how you can make that look more uh, consistent? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's obviously, you know, having consistency user interface model driven apps is great because everything looks the same. 
um, all the you know fields, all the text boxes, all the drop down lookups. But yeah, you're right. It does start to get to that point where if you've got a custom page, it can be quite a jarring experience. Experience, yeah. and I've seen a lot of stuff, examples of custom pages where you know started working on a project and you you're in your model driven app, da, 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 and suddenly you click on a button. It's like whoa, there. It's just like what's going on? It's green and red and blue. And like, you know, my mum used to say, you know, <laughs> whether red and green should never be seen unless there's something in between and all these kind of rules of design and uh, all this stuff. And you're like, ah, I'm, I'm blind, but yeah, it, it's difficult. I mean, with the modern controls and I know because you do a fantastic job, Matthew, with your blog, I, I love reading your blog posts. Um, they're just so well laid out and so well thought out and clearly expressed right from the beginning, you know, what, what am I gonna, what am I showing you here? And, and, and then you do such a good job of actually showing it in such easy ways to, I mean, even I can follow it, which is quite, you know, remarkable. So, um, <laughs> but, but, you know, you've recently done a, did some, um, did some posts on how to create a custom page. And I thought your custom page looked great. It looked, it yeah. looked very similar to a model driven app. And you've also sort of talked about the, you've done a whole blog post around documenting the modern controls. Um, so, yes. you know, yes. what's those your, what's your view great. on that story? Yeah, those look great on a custom page. Uh, definitely because, uh, what do we use inside of model driven forms and views? We use the fluent UI controls from Microsoft and now they're bringing that to canvas too. So it's going to create much more consistent experience, um, switching from custom pages and out of the box. Um, I think props to you, Scott, on creating the creator kit or at least being involved in that. Yes. Okay. All yeah. right. Thank you so much. Um, I've used that a ton of my custom pages because the controls in there really match the look and feel and line up well, um, with what's already in, in a model driven app. And in fact, if I'm going to make a recommendation, uh, Matt's recommendation, <laughs> <laughs> go ahead and try out those creator kids, creator kit controls first, uh, the model, the modern experimental controls, model experiment controls, the modern controls are still experimental. And so you can't theme them. Um, there's still bugs that are being worked out. Go use the, go use the creator kit, but at some point it's going to be time to use those modern controls. Like instead, I understand that the creator kit is kind of a test ground or, you know, the first jump over to fluent UI and now it's, and then it's going to be modern controls full bowl later, but, uh, Scott, I say thank you for that. Thank you for your contribution to that. It's it's great. I use it all the time. No, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And yeah, and, it, and that's exactly what it was designed for: is to provide that that bridge between where we were, which was blue style, big blobby things, <laughs> um, and and, and what and what model driven business applications and the whole fluent UI uh, style design language is trying to give. Um, but I, I do see a lot of, a lot of your, um, the apps that you, you blog about, uh, do have quite a unique user interface, you know, that, that doesn't have the fluent UI. Um, so if, if, a, if somebody was saying, well, I'm not really sure about this fluent UI in model driven apps, you know, what would your be advice, be your advice around user interface design and that, you know, how do you typically approach that with customers when you're, you know, first starting out designing an app and they've got a very specific look and feel in mind and they, you know, saying, we'd like it to look like this. And you're thinking, well, model driven looks like this. So you know, <laughs> how do you kind of work with people? Well, most of the clients that we work for, with are medium to large enterprise. So they have a marketing department, they have their branding guidelines. It's, it's all thought out. We're never kind of creating that from scratch. So we, we got the color palette, right? We set that up in the, in the on start property, the app or the formulas property. We got their, we got their fonts. We got all that good stuff. Um, but when I'm creating a custom page that looks markedly different from the model driven app, um, I usually only like to do that if it's the first landing page that we get into because it's kind of jarring to go back and forth between those, mm. those two things. Um, and really just try and keep it simple there. Um, if you, pop red for bad everywhere and green for good everywhere. And then blue, cause you like blue and yellow, cause you like yellow. You start to come up with this really weird mishmash of colors. It's just too much and a shock to the senses. Um, so I like to keep it simple. Just try and keep it uh, monochromatic with, Hey, maybe some, some darker grays, lighter grays, maybe pick a accent color, like a blue or, or something to fit the client's branding and just really make it look uh, bare bones from there. Go for the minimalist approach. 
Yeah, I mean that 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 kind of minimalist is kind of like fluent UI all over, isn't it? It's it's uh it's quite a yeah, like you're saying yeah. popping certain colors and certain uh, pieces of information that are really important, but then the rest of it sort of just is a, a little less understated. Um, and uh, but the the fluent UI language obviously has evolving, right? So you know that's right. it's a journey. You know, mm -hmm. If you look at the way it was back. I don't know, three, three years ago compared to where it is now with Fluent B9 and the, the teams, um, was it North Star and Stardust and all these other different names they, they have yeah. for, for the user interfaces. Um, it's quite, quite different. So it, it, it's, a, it's almost like a moving target. Um, so so what, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, sorry. What's a moving target? <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I mean, what, what, what's your thought on that? You know, like, and how if you if you design a, a custom page because that's one of the things about model driven apps, and this is one of the things I struggle with a lot. Is that um, you say to a customer, it's like, okay, well, we can create a custom page. That's great, mm -hmm. and uh, yes. we'll build that, and uh, and it'll look like this, and we'll design it very specifically. And you know, Microsoft always used to say <laughs> pixel perfect. You know, that was the big thing about Canvas apps, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't like that phrase because nothing's ever pixel perfect. It almost encourages people to say, uh, that pixels are not quite right. <laughs> Can you move that one pixel to the left and then that'll be better. But, um, uh, yeah, and, and, <laughs> but, but the, the thing is, is that if you build that custom page, you're using very specific user interface controls such that then model driven app suddenly changes. And now almost overnight, yes. your custom page is out of out of sync with the user interface. I'd, I'd approach that the same way as I approach anything else in development. And that seems like it's something that could be in the future, could not be in the future, could be there in the far in the future. And I, I don't try and plan for every contingency when I'm programming of things that could possibly happen or every user story that we could possibly do. Um, yeah. I just worry about the, hey, is it gonna look good here and now? And certainly if you try and make your model driven pages look exactly like the out of the box forms, you could be setting yourself up for some technical debt later. But yeah. also, how much money do you think Microsoft has poured into that user interface and user experience uh, design with actual professional designers? You know, even if it no longer matches up, it's still going to look pretty good, right? It's still going to look pretty good, way better than a former accountant could design. <laughs> 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 there, there's something to be said of, of looking like a chameleon to begin with. And, you know, so if you're yeah. copying something that's, that's decent to begin with, you should be left with still a decent design. It just may be a little bit different. And so, yeah, it would make sense to why, why you don't know the future. You can't invest in something that's going to be future proof anyway. So, you know, fix, you know, look at what you're doing now and make it efficient and, and fit with what you have now. So yeah, that makes sense. I, I really love that approach, that kind of pragmatic approach. And I think you're yeah. not trying to make it look exactly like the rest of the stuff, but enough, enough like it, that it doesn't feel like you said, Matthew, like jarring, you know, going between the things. And I think, you know, you get into that good enough. Um, but, but if you try and make it pixel perfect, make it exactly, then something's going to be not right. And someone's going to pick it out. <laughs> Yeah, and you start getting yourself into that decision paralysis and, and really slow down your development. So like we always say, uh, make it work, then make it right, then make it beautiful. And hopefully you have time to make it beautiful. <laughs> ah, that's great. Yeah. I, so I have an idea now for, for an April Fool's prank that you could pull. You could like What's take that? your take your, 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 your custom page you have that's you know fairly you know, fluent UI looking and, and fits right in and like reef skin it in like a uh like crm 2011 like <laughs> <laughs> form <laughs> so it's like wow this is crm 2011 ui like yeah that'd be great just, just for a day it. just just to be like what the heck is this maybe i'll put some yeah. like windows 3.1 folders on there pop yes. the dialog box yes. open yep. now that would be a hot looking custom yes. UI. yes yeah so that's what clients want but yeah, <laughs> like, like, retro theme. Ago. The funny part yeah. is like none of us want the old theme like permanently. Right? You know, we laugh about it here, but but yeah. still, Clippy seems to be the one thing that we all <laughs> we also want. We want Clippy. We want we want Chat you, uh, GPT to be Clippy. I mean, we want it to be there. You know, we want, we want our Clippies. So anyway, yeah, yeah. There, yeah, well, yeah. there are a couple of like little gotchas that I want to point out with custom pages. Totally. So Daryl, as you know, with the model driven forms and views, they're responsive out of the box, right? 
yeah. set them up in there. They're, they're good to go. And they, they, they handle all that. Fun. Yes. All the stuff that I hate dealing with as a developer. Yes. Continue. <laughs> <laughs> it just does it for you in the mall driven app, but in the canvas app, you have to actually go and flick that on and make sure that you're developing a responsive canvas app. Otherwise it's going to do some weird things like, like zoom out and just always fit the same size in the page, same aspect ratio, like your television's always four, three, it'll always be four, three. Mm -hmm. Got to make sure you do that. And the other weird kind of peculiarity is when you're setting your font sizes, it's getting a little bit technical and nerdy. Usually you want to do it to a, like a 16 pixel font size, because that's the universal standard for designing, um, um, on, for the web in canvas apps. We call that 12 point because 12 points is 16 pixels. Ooh, doing a little bit of public math there. All right. Now. New public math. But you, you're the accountant. It's going yeah, completely yeah. out of my head. So, yeah. is, is one the metric system of measurement and one not? Anyway, continue. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't do that. We don't do public math on this podcast, right? Um, <laughs> but when you're developing you for a custom page, uh, you actually have to make that font size uh, downscale to 10.5 because it actually zooms in and everything that you use to programming is certain. Uh, width and height uh, in a normal canvas app it's actually like upscale so you need to actually get a little bit pixel perfect in that one to make sure it maintains accessibility okay so you said you, normally we're dealing with uh um pixel size or, or 16, 16 16 we don't do public <laughs> math we don't do public what is math it? <laughs> what does that mean when you're in the canvas app and you're editing yeah. it you you want your si font size to be 16 right normally your standard font size is going to be 12 points so 12 in points. microsoft word they use points not pixels and by yes. the way canvas apps they want to be like microsoft office and word so that's 12 points so points. Yes. when you're progr programming for the custom page your minimum font shot size should always be 10.5 okay. and that so way you should make sure that most smaller. folks and visually impaired people are also able to um, see what's going on in your app. That was actually one of the challenges with the creator kit is that making that decision between points and pixels, because <laughs> it was, it was like, well, mm, points is what canvas apps uses, but actually as soon as you move over to custom pages, actually pixels is more appropriate. <laughs> um, because canvas apps is all, is all, uh, sorry, model driven apps is all set in pixels. All the font sizes are set in pixels, all of the heights of text boxes are all set in pixels. So in order to kind of make a custom page look right in uh, inside a um, model driven app, you do actually have to use pixels rather than points. So in some of the controls, you can select if you want points or pixels, but for the most, and in fact, Fluent UI doesn't use points either. So Fluent UI uses pixels for, for things like font sizes and heights. Like for example, the, the header is 32 pixels high for a, for a grid and things like that. And these, these are just fixed pixel sizes. I love having it my way. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I had a, a fun time at Summit. Obviously, we, you know, I'm around people that are not American and, and get to kind of see all the differences I don't even think about. And, and Gustav was talking about how, you know, we have all these America needs to get out, get rid of the metric system. Like, yes, I know we just can't think that way. But then he's like, but you know, and then you screw us over too, because we don't <laughs> buy TVs in, in the metric system. They're, they're inches. <laughs> so you, you, no one goes and buys a, a metric TV. They're all like 55 inch TVs. So, uh, I was like, yes, we're, we're sticking it to you still. So it's kind of <laughs> to, to, to at least, you know, I don't think anyone goes to their local uh, electronic shop and starts yelling at people that TVs are pixels there. Um, they just, they've gotten used to it and they don't think about it and so like, that's what i think about when it comes to miles i just got used to it don't think about it so i had my little uh, cross-cultural moment there with uh, shane young shane young of mm -hmm. camp steps uh, fame mm -hmm. we went up for lunch together at chick-fil-a that guy loves chick-fil-a he's oh, been yeah? to yeah. chick-fil-a um three times in one day and they've actually given him award for doing so in three different states <laughs> um but by the way um he said you gotta come down you gotta try the chicken sandwich it's absolutely amazing and i'm like you mean a chicken burger right? He's like, no, it's a chicken sandwich. But no, it's it's between like two buns. That's that's a burger, right? It's It doesn't matter what's in the, He's like, no, it's a sandwich. Um, so Canadians call it a burger and Americans call it a sandwich. That's what I figured out when I was a chicken. It's like it. the AI, you know, like, was it, there was a, there was an AI app a while ago. It was like, is it a hot dog or not? Did you ever see that, that app where you could take a picture and it would tell you if it's a hot dog or is it not a hot dog? You know, it was, it was very specific AI. You know, that's all it did. You know, 
<laughs> it's like, so we can have the same thing. Is it bur- is it a burger or not a burger? You know, I've seen like, a similar one. I've seen puppy or muffin. And if you think about it, the little puppy's eyes, if they're black, the puppy could kind of look like a muffin if he's like a labradoodle or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there's a the whole thing. It's like, you know, the, the more philosophical discussion about at what point does it become a chair? You know, if you've got, a, is it a table? Is, is it actually a chair? You know, can you sit on? Well, you can sit on it. Is it really a table? Is it a chair then? Well, no, it has to have a back on it. Well, what if you put a back on a table? Is that a chair? Very, very <laughs> philosophical. <Yes. laughs> Yes, definitions are, are important and kind of funny and, and, and serious at the same time, right? Did you, did you see the uh, the beer commercial that went on, the uh, the AI-generated beer commercial? No, oh, that was mildly like, really disturbing, yeah. Yeah, there was like <laughs> flames going everywhere. They had uh, the Bare Naked Ladies song, um, whatever, mm-hmm. playing in the background. But then they changed it slightly in the repeated yeah. area. It was interesting. And then like people are like drinking, but they're not drinking. Like it's like this far away from their, their, their mouth and then like a couple – inches you know whatever 40 centimeters whatever away from their mouth and yeah it was just it was weird it was sort of absorbing beer by not not yes. really drinking it more sort of uh, yeah it was yeah it was i was i had nightmares actually yeah, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> the, the interesting thing that did bring up to me is that um it, it created things that aren't that are sort of like something we we think of but then it's not related mm-hmm. to anything we think of at all it's like what the heck is that thing so the ability to come up with something that you can't comprehend is very difficult. And so, you know, that was kind of interesting to think about, oh, well, now we have a way to come up with things we can't comprehend. I don't think we have any uses for them, though, so that's interesting, too. But it's just kind of an interesting thought experiment in that aspect. Have you guys been using AI much in your work at all lately? Microsoft's biggest thing is, you know, copilot, copilot, copilot. Everyone is screaming out chat, GPT, GPT, GPT. Um, it had to come up at some point, didn't it? I mean, that's literally every podcast now. There yes, has to yeah, be yeah. around. Well, I've already mentioned it once. Yeah, so. do this the second time. <laughs> yeah. it's like, I think copilot is going to be a mandatory phrase we have to yes. use from now on around the 30 yeah. minute mark. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was very excited that um, that I uh, realized that we actually get GitHub copilot. So that's for the non developers out there. That's the, uh, nice. the, the in Visual Studio or NBS code. Uh, AI experience for, for, for coding, right? And um, and it I've used it uh, multiple times since I've got the access to it. And I'm on the new uh, the new preview version of it as well, the Copilot X Copilot stuff, X. so you can yeah. chat with it mm-hmm. and that kind of stuff. So that was very very helpful. But it's still uh, <laughs> I have to figure out <laughs> some some issues with it. Like Resharper wants to fight with it, so I'll see it auto complete. Like yes, that's exactly what I want. I click tab and then Resharper like gives me something instead and it's not at all what was showing there. I'm like, oh no, that's not what I wanted. I, I want what I want. And so now I'm having to kind of fight with it to get to do what I want to do. It's like, you know, picture you have a vacuum, right? And you're, you're vacuuming yeah. and there's something you spill on the ground, right? And you know, you, you vacuum, you, you, you uh, maybe it lands on like a chair or something. And so you, you like knock it off the chair in order to vacuum it up. Cause you know, the vacuum is what's doing the work where you could just pick it up and like hold it. Like, it's just interesting how we get to those, uh, those aspects of we want this tool to do it. And so now we start doing weird things in order to get the tool to do it when we could probably just do it just as easy ourselves. So. Yeah, that's a great point. Like, how do you, how do you decide when it's time to use AI or not? I ran into this dilemma recently. Um, I'm a Dataverse guy. I know my way around the Dataverse web API. I'm probably not as good as you guys, but uh, I'm, I'm getting there. Uh, but I recently had to build a solution that involves SharePoint. And I wanted to know, um, I have SharePoint site. There's all these document libraries on the site. How can I see who is allowed to get into each SharePoint library? And I didn't want to figure that out for myself. I thought it would be a very long time to learn the SharePoint REST API. But then I called on my good friend Chat GPT. And by the way, it's just kind of spitting up the answer right there. Now, the dilemma I have is if I'm actually going to go do that for myself, then I kind of solidify that knowledge and I learn it and I can actually do it uh, just as fast and actually understand it with Chat GPT. I'm kind of learning, losing that learning opportunity and losing the opportunity to get those reps in. Like, is using PPT actually making me dumber? Um, I, I don't know. How do you, how do you feel about that, guys, as programmers? I think, isn't this the same the same reaction that um, our parents had to things like the internet? So, like, <laughs> well, in my day, I had to go to the Encyclopedia Britannica and I uh, and look it up at the library, and it was much better exercise. And I think, you know, we we we've got it goes, you know, it just goes in 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 ways, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Here's here's what I'll answer that with, Matt, is that. You tend to now focus on the things you want to focus on. 
and then <laughs> try to push off the things you don't want to do to it. So yes, maybe you, you've, you've missed your opportunity to learn whatever that one thing is you were working on. But yep. generally, that means now you're going to be focusing on something else, and maybe that you find enjoyable. And rather than even thinking about using it, you go, oh, I'm just going to, you know, this is what I like to do. I'm going to do that. And then you you go back to, you know, the you use it with those stuff you don't like to do, right? Um, right. And that's that's an interesting thing they, they talk about. It. So they, they talk about their productivity gains, but then they also talk about, like, so talk about the, um, the social gains. Like, it's like 77% or something report a higher job satisfaction from mm -hmm. using uh, GitHub Copilot because... Now they're able to focus on things either they're comfortable with or they like doing and, you know, help to kind of push the stuff off that they don't like doing or, you know, it's the stuff that, I, you know, is a perfect fit for me is stuff that you do once every two years. Like, I don't, I don't need to remember what I do every two years. If it takes two minutes to learn it, I don't need to spend an hour trying to figure it out. I'll just two minutes, two minutes every two years and great. I'll, I'll save time in my life. Right. Um, and so that's where it works out really well. I feel like in those situations and other areas where you start doing it a lot, you just don't need it more because you're, doing it without having yeah, to think about it. I, I totally agree with that. I mean, I, I feel as though I now think about the things that I I need to be thinking about in order to do my job mm -hmm. rather than thinking about stuff that it is just just kind of plumbing stuff. Like when I'm using GitHub Copilot, just doing things like null checking and, and, and for loops and adding things in and it could just generate that code for me. I don't need to worry about it. and sometimes it's scarily correct i mean you you write yeah. a comment and you say this is what i need to do and it's like well there's the code and you go actually that is exactly the code and i'm just going to pick that code and and you, you're right it is totally satisfying because you feel as though now i'm think i i can think about what i'm what value i'm providing because writing those 10 lines of code was never going to provide value in itself the end result is the value so i can now be concentrating on actually how to provide better value you know how can it make it better as a product rather than just spending all that time doing that grunt work kind of stuff so yeah i i think it's a i think it's going to be really um definitely a step in the right direction um uh, whether or not it's going to take over the government and uh you know and, and start <laughs> wars like my neighbor's concerned about i don't know but uh, <laughs> I, I'm more concerned about humans, to be honest. So you know, <laughs> yeah, it's a big. It's a big gun, right? You can shoot things you don't want to shoot, or not. No, not uh, you don't, you don't let any any computer in charge of important decisions. But, uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. But, yes. Um, but you know, mm -hmm. the the whole building apps using building mm -hmm. Power Effects and building custom pages and stuff using um, AI. Um, I mean, that, that's an interesting concept because we're already at that high level. Cause like when we're writing low level code, you know, you're writing lines and lines of code just to do really complex stuff that you don't have to work. Whereas when you, when you're already in a low code environment, the idea is, is that you will, you should already be in a, uh, a place where you're not writing very much code anyway. So it, it will be interesting to see how much AI can help with that. Um, you know, because yeah. you're then you're thinking about you're already thinking about the complex things, the, the things that are delivering value, like how do I structure my tables so they give me the right information hierarchy, information architecture, all of that kind of stuff. Here's what I like about where we are with Canvas apps and AI, and here's where I think we need to go. Um, Canvas app Copilot pops a little pane open on the side, and if you have a problem. You can go and type your, your question there, right? If there's something you don't know how to do or what you want to know, you type into a little box and it's just one step closer than going to Google. It's one step closer than going to my mm -hmm. website. Um, as much as I like the traffic, I like the hits, uh, sorry, but I guess it's just a little bit closer. I'm going to be out of business soon. Um, but it's, it's much better than a knowledge base, right? Because you're getting a, a static answer with the knowledge base and here you're getting something that's much more relevant to you. Um, but where I think it needs to go is code completion. So. Now I'm trying to execute something and do something inside of the formula bar for Canvas apps. Um, but what I want to see as I'm typing my formula out is some type of suggestion as I'm typing it, right? Um, this already happens in Git Copilot for GitHub today for other pro code languages. Why can't we now bring that into Canvas apps and make <laughs> that job much easier for, for, for low code developers and citizen developers? That's where I think. You you want in on the action, basically. You know, it's like that's what I, it is. I want in, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want all the fun tools that uh, Daryl and Scott have on at my disposal. 
why are they I, keeping it from us <laughs> this conspiracy to, to keep keep the the low coders down <laughs> <laughs> i'm at the next level of ai that um knows me particularly and knows my own get off my porch sort of you know uh feelings on how things should be done and like formatted even like in low code like you know i want my formatting done the way that i always do it hey look at how i formatted you know this first method and apply that formatting to the rest of this project that i just inherited or you know you know automatically format that you know what i'm doing that i don't want to have to think about okay each time i do this i put this on a new line each time i do it if i do this like just see it and then just do it for me and and, and not make me force myself to always be uh adhering to that standard like do it yeah so you mean outside of the project mm -hmm. you're currently working on because because it github copilot seems to know about the project you're working on because it yeah you know, it, it suggests stuff. It looks at the rest of the code and it suggests stuff that's in line oh. with all the other cards. Code. Yes and no. Like it, it never uses, it always, it never uses var. I don't think, I don't think I've ever seen it use var. It always uses <laughs> a full name and you know, I, I hate using anything but oh. var because now okay. I've got to go and, and, uh, and this is for declaring variables in C sharp, which is nice. a completely different level of, 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 of context there. But yeah. yeah. Uh, so those types of things, if it looked at the project, it would see that, yeah, this is, you know the standard oh, way right. coding style reason. stuff right yes yeah. yeah. coding yeah. style stuff oh, interesting. there's so not a right want, or a wrong to it yeah. so what, what you want do you want an ai that's totally tailored to you you want the daryl yeah. as a service you want the I want my own co-pilot the matt as a service and i think that's um yeah a big challenge because when you start to put data into the model or feed it in you don't know where it got that inspiration from to give you your answer um at the very um, at the, in the nicest case scenario, it's just not doing it how you want to do it. At the worst case scenario, it's plagiarizing someone else's work or doing something that might be protected. Think mm -hmm. of if you're bringing AI into a highly like regulated industry or, or you're doing it, um, let's say as a, as a design outfit, right? Maybe you're like in a fashion house, but maybe the AI came up with some design inspiration that was actually your competitors. Maybe what you want to do is train it on your whole back catalog of everything that you've ever released as a fashion designer. You know, they have these archives, right? And every these companies has a huge archive. Maybe what we need is an AI that we can train on our own archives to be behaving more like us. I kind of yeah. think that's where, where the future is headed in that, in that respect. So then maybe there is a future still for the tools like ReSharper and, and, and ESLint and all, all of those kind of things, you know? Because that's because it's like the deterministic stuff. It's the stuff that yeah. is yeah. is applying to things outside of, like you say, Matthew. All of that. I don't know where this came from. I've got it. Just it came from some magic thing that I've got no idea. And then and then you run it through the the filter of like the sanity check filter and the and the style, yeah. you know, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, maybe, maybe there's a hybrid there. But um, so we we kind of talked about. Obviously, you know, you wanting Matthew, you wanting Copilot for Power Apps. You know, this is your your your, yes, your big asks. Um, what 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 other things? What other, what else is on your list? You know, if we were to be you know sending off a list to Microsoft to say, well, this is what are the things we want for for custom pages or cust or Canvas apps. What what would be at your your top top items there? Yeah, you guys are in luck. I, I came prepared. Um, <laughs> I have a huge wish, wish list for Canvas apps, and that's not because Canvas apps aren't great. I mean, they're totally awesome. But if you use a product every single day and you live inside of it, you know exactly uh, what you want, right? Biggest thing on my list is I want a custom theming editor. In model-driven yeah. apps, if you want things to look alike, you just go to the theming page and go boop, 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 and there you go. In a Canvas app, you've got to style each control individually. What we need is a global way to do this, and we need it soon because everybody who ever creates an app has to create a theme. And if it takes 10 hours or 12 hours to theme the controls in each and every app that you do, you multiply that by the number of apps out there and the number of creators that there are. Absolutely huge number. And if we can shrink that number to zero, well, we have a lot more apps in the world, right? Mm. Wouldn't that absolutely be fantastic? It would um, absolutely, especially custom other, pages. And it could apply to a custom page as well as the rest of the model-driven app. You know, if you've got a theme yeah. that applies everything, that would be awesome. There's there's two other ones that are on my wish list. Um, the second one is is custom functions. So in the pro code world, I love being able to define a custom function, put some inputs in, and get something out. Canvas apps kind of have that, but not really. 
you could pass in numbers and text and get number texts numbers or text out but hey what if i could tell a function to do a series of actions or a series of commands behavior type functions are missing from powers functions and we really really need them you know it's all about mm -hmm. it's all about saving time like like mm -hmm. that type of thing. and if uh yeah if i were to pick uh one more thing from that list in Power BI, I really, really love how you can go to a marketplace and download new components, new components that you don't have to build. Someone else has already been kind enough to create them. And we already have that, uh, you know, in our world, PCF gallery, but you have to go to the website, right? And I love those guys and they do great work and everyone on the site there does great work. Why can't we have that inside the product? Why can't it just be a one click? This is safe, right? Everyone's verified it. The community says it's good. Here's who it's made by. Here's the start rating. Click it. It's in your app. Can you imagine a one-click uh, install for the creator kit, Scotty? Yeah, be awesome. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'll select all, install. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 you know that's gonna happen because that's what people do in yeah. the search toolbox. Yeah. Like, it installs all this stuff. Like, ah, oh, they just install everything. Yeah. <laughs> so those are those are kind of my my top three right now, and I'm thinking about this uh, each and every day, and I'm sure you guys have your wish list too. But uh, yeah, those are those are my top three. No, definitely, those are, those are really good items. Um, so yeah, uh, hopefully soon we will should have those. Is, is there anything specific, specific to custom pages? You know, because we were talking also talk, talking about custom pages. You know, is there anything that you, uh, you when you were when you first started using custom pages, having come from that kind of you know the guru that you are in in canvas apps when you went into custom pages you went hang on a minute this is a bit different you know why does it work like this or you know that that kind of line of thinking yeah well well let me ask you this do you, do custom pages currently support offline just like model driven apps do i don't believe no. that they do no, and i don't. think that that's imperative if we're going to include these custom pages inside of a model driven app um it needs to be needs to be a full member of the family it just needs yeah. to have needs to have all of the same abilities that you can from a model driven page, um, and I would also like to be able to access the model driven theme from that custom page. Hook into that somehow. I'm, I'm sure there's a way. If there's some smart person who can figure it out, just subscribe or uh, comment on this podcast. But I would love to be able to do <laughs> that too, because then if it's just a matter of configuration, right? And if you're you're sending a solution out to the client and they want to change something about the theme, then they just have to configure it. They don't have to talk to their developers. Those are the two yeah. biggest things that I want in the custom page. I think one of the items about on that the, the experimental modern controls blog post that came out was yeah. that yeah. that's that's coming. You know, the, the ability to have right. you know some, more of a, a consistent theming approach to the, to those modern controls. So yeah, hopefully that should move in that direction, fingers crossed. We also ought so, to mention so that custom pages, um, they're not premium, right? They're all included within the standard licensing. I guess model-driven apps are inherently premium, but <laughs> um, people always ask that question, like are, are custom pages going to make my app premium? And then it's like, no, it's actually already a premium app. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not any more than it already is. That's, that's <laughs> yes. the answer. Go and get more premium. <laughs> so the uh, the custom page it's you, it's not an app you're inserting. It's just a particular one page, right? You don't you don't get multiple pages. You get one page you're inserting into the to that area of the model driven app, correct? That's a, that's a great point. So by default, a custom page is only that a single page. But if you'd like, you can have it behave like a model driven app or a Canvas app where you can navigate to different screens. Now, I don't necessarily recommend that you mm -hmm. do that because that's not how the user interface is expected to behave. But if you want to, there's an experimental setting and you can go ahead and do it. It's not gonna let you do it out of the box. Um, another great thing about custom pages is you don't have to just navigate to another custom page from that initial one. You can target a form you can target a view. Uh, you can target pretty much anything in a model-driven app. If you want to navigate to a form, you just put in that form that that entity's name, and you put in the GUID, and away you go. You're navigating there. If you want to do the view, you say navigate, and then you put in the view, the view name. Gets you gets you right over there. So lots of great options to navigate to you to, to where you need to go. My top top two 
requests for that Ooh. it's firstly being able to navigate to a quick create form from a, from uh, a custom page yeah that would be awesome fingers crossed and secondly being able to navigate to a custom page as a modal pop-up from inside a custom page or inside from in, indeed from a, a, from a command command bar power effects expression as well because at the moment you've got to use javascript and you can't just can't do it in a custom page there's no way of in a custom page having a button that opens up a modal dialogue with another custom page um so those are my top if you if those two things were possible the number of things that we could do would just be like magnitudes higher so yeah hmm. Yeah, that'd be that'd be amazing. I've gotten a bunch of comments on my blog post about popping up modal modal that say like I'm a I'm a citizen developer. I'm a loco developer. Why is this why is this so hard? Why do I have to learn JavaScript? Are you really gonna make me learn <laughs> JavaScript? And you're right, it really should just be it always should just be. Um drop down, how is this page gonna manifest itself? Is it gonna be a yeah. full page? Is it gonna be a pop up or is it going to be a, a side pane? That's why I built the the smart buttons in the ribbon workbench was to be able to do that because in, in the, there's a smart button for open <laughs> custom page. You just drag it on to the, the command bar and you give it the name of the custom page and it kind of does it for you. You don't have to learn JavaScript, but you know it, it, it should be just in the PowerFX uh, expression language for us to do that. So, um, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be I'm going to be my a typical user here is like. How hard can it be? <laughs> <laughs> it can be very hard. Um, yes. I'm not going to lie. When I made that blog post about modals, it probably <laughs> took me about three hours to figure out how to do the JavaScript right in the first place. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. you don't feel bad. Right? I make it look easy. It ain't easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's always easy when everyone sees the finished product. They don't get to see how long you spent working. They on don't it, right? see the struggle. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. I'm check, my checking in code, you know, maybe I spent a day struggling with something and I ended up like 20 lines of code. It's like, man, my, oh. my, my lines oh, were hours horrible, yeah. but they don't see all the code I wrote that didn't work. Didn't you know? work. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. I think we should do that. We should actually have some kind of add in for, for, for visual studio or, or a VS code. Do you track your even... mistakes per hour. I'm not sure. Yeah, like well, it was just like, it just kind of collects all the stuff that you deleted you know it's like it kind of gradually <laughs> builds up and builds up and it's like here's all the crap you didn't want what is this yeah. I, don't, I don't understand this what's the purpose of this <laughs> just it's to the... demonstrate you know just for your own sanity like oh yeah i did do loads of stuff today <laughs> 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 all oh, it's just a, it's a it's a great a great uh reminder for those that feel like they're they're um, faking it just to know that um, <laughs> you you have to struggle with it. It just doesn't doesn't come naturally for any of us for things. You, even no. with lots of experience, you're still yeah. Sit down, and just write something from scratch and get it right the first time. It never happens. I, I I've never I've still never mm -hmm. gotten a plugin where I just wrote it and you know I wrote unit tests and all the unit tests pass and everything was yep. perfect and, and I've yep. never no matter how small it is. No matter how small it is, I still always make some mistake that I either catch with a unit you know, test or with an actual deployment and go, oh, yeah, I, I didn't handle this or that. So I don't think I've written a pipeline for uh, great the first time either. I've never gotten that perfect. And off to the client, why is this on run number 23? Well, I think I failed 22 times. Before <laughs> I I the great thing is once you get it set in, it just never yes. breaks again, right? So yes. good to go. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Well, we've kind of ran the whole gamut here. We've gone from canvas app, page, custom pages, to AI, to points versus pixels, to chicken burgers and chicken sandwiches, <laughs> to wish lists, and to chicken custom burgers. pages, and, and so chicken burgers. Yes, like so. So I think we, I think we've covered like everything we could possibly cover, and then some, uh, in our time. So, so Matt, is there anything else that you, that that I'm missing that that our our listeners will be missing, or or maybe what's the big next thing that's coming out for yourself that you'd like to spend some time? And I know it's very non-Canadian, but stand on a soapbox and, and and share what you're doing and and give a little humble brag here or not. Well, if this is a spot in the show where this I can do a shameless me. plug, shameless uh, plug, yes. shameless plug. Uh, come on down and check out my website, matthewdevaney.com. I've got a blog article on just about every Canvas app topic that you could think of. Uh, no word of a lie. And if you like what I do, hit subscribe. And I'll send you an email each and every Monday morning with something fresh and new about Canvas apps. And you're going to learn a lot. Come join me. Ooh, subscription list. What a wonderful little plug. Maybe I'll just have that be the intro. Hey, this is Matt. Okay. <laughs>
Yeah, people people get mad because they're used to what, what we always do. So anyway, <laughs> never know, but, Matt, it was great. It was great getting to meet you in person. Um, I think I met like ten people that I've had on the show in person for the first time at Summit. So that was awesome. It was great meeting in person. It's great going out and getting ice cream with fish pancakes. I don't know how to describe that that ice cream, but that was, it was great. It was great. You sacrificed your uh, your dairy issues for with ice cream for me. So I know. Like <laughs> Sounds a bit messy. <laughs> <laughs> it was his choice. I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't, had no Come idea on. it was even an issue. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, thanks for doing that. Thanks for coming on the show and and, and sharing uh, with us. So uh, you mentioned your your website. Uh, go ahead and share your um, your social uh, ways for people to get hold of you as well. Yeah, the best place to find me is on Twitter at Matt B Devaney. That's D E V A N E Y. You can also hit me up on LinkedIn by just typing in my name. All right. Awesome. Well, Scott, that's how our listeners can get a hold of our guests. How can they get a hold of us? Well, Daryl, yes, you can get hold of us by email at cast at xrmtoolbox.com or you can get us on Twitter and LinkedIn at xrmtoolcast. And as always, we would love to hear from you. Um, and thank you very much, Matthew, for, for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure and really been interesting to hear about all the different you. views and so some really great uh, perspectives there. And yeah, I, I do hope that I get to have an ice cream date with you soon as well. <laughs> <laughs> Something said screen date for a second, but ice cream date. Yes, yes. Would, yes. <laughs> I'll uh, pencil you in on my dance card for Microsoft <laughs> Power Platform Conference 2023. Yes. It's, it's, uh, it's getting me full that list, right? But uh, I think I can squeeze you in there for a little ice cream date. No, I would I might, much appreciate it. Just get on yes. one of those really long highways we're talking about, Scott. You don't even need a passport. You can go see. Yeah, I mean, never get that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Matt. It's great seeing you. Have a good one, and we'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye, -bye. Cheers. This has been the XRM Toolcast with Daryl Labar and Scott Durrell, produced by Lynn Zawin. If you have any questions or suggestions, please send them to cast at xrmtoolbox.com, tweet at xrmtoolcast, or hit us up on our LinkedIn XRM Toolcast page.